I want to first mention that uh, Bob was born in Palo Alto uh, way back in, I think it's 1943, if I got it right. That's correct. <laughs> and uh, he got his uh, undergraduate degree at Berkeley, got his PhD at MIT, came back to Stanford, came back to Palo Alto in 1978. And uh, it's terrific that he's here. Uh, believe it or not, Bob and I wrote a textbook together. I noticed it's 35 years ago, 35, 35th anniversary of a textbook in macro, which David Propel uh, succeeded in doing a much better job, in my view. Um, we are, I think Bob's still involved in business cycles, the chair of the business cycle dating committee, and, and his paper is about uh, business cycles, about the similarities over time. Uh, the title is, Why Has the U.S. Economy Recovered So Consistently for Every Recession, from Every Recession, the Past 70 Years? So uh, we're uh, taping this, uh, as you know. If you'd like to ask a question, just jump in. You have a mechanical hand or you have the chat function. Uh, Bob will take questions uh, throughout. We're not going to save the questions at the end. So. If you have some complaints, Bob especially wants critical complaints, so don't hold back if you have them. And uh, we're, we're anxious to get started, Bob, and thank you for joining us uh, so you can proceed. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and I, I, I want to encourage, I don't have to encourage John Cochran, but I need to encourage everybody else to emulate John uh, and tell me what's wrong with this paper. Uh, it's, it's very much up for grabs because this, it's coming out of the macro annual, NBER macro annual, but um, we have a whole revision cycle ahead. So any, it's wide open for uh, improvements. Um, it's joint with Mariana Kudliak at the San Francisco Fed. Uh, and because of that, uh, we need to emphasize uh, that the views in this paper do not reflect those of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank or or the National Bureau of Economic Research, because we, we deal with the uh, question of business cycle chronologies, which overlaps with the uh, NBER's interest. So this is not, despite of my involvement in that, nothing here is to be interpreted as the NBER's views. Okay, so I'm gonna start by describing the four principal claims uh, that uh, are expressed in this paper and uh, we believe we make some progress on uh, demonstrating uh, their validity. So the first, the first, our first claim uh, is that when you look at unemployment, it's very important that, that we're looking at unemployment here and not other measures of business cycle, of the business cycle. Um, uh, I believe for a long time that, uh, that unemployment is neglected as an indicator. Uh, and uh, there's a, a recent paper by the Romers that makes a very cogent case uh, that unemployment should be the leading cyclical indicator. Um, uh, the, there's a homogeneity in the recovery process uh, revealed uh, in the data, uh, which is that the annual reduction in the unemployment rate during a recovery is stable at around 10% of the current level of unemployment. So I'll, uh, let me show you the, the set the evidence on that. I'll come back to, we'll talk about this again more when we get into the main part of the paper, but uh, this is, this is uh, log unemployment uh, and log unemployment declines along a straight line. That's fact number one uh, and, and a very important, it suggests and I, we make we try to make a case that that's that's kind of fundamental that there are basic reasons uh, rooted in the modern theory of unemployment as to why when there isn't a major shock working um, that uh, unemployment gradually the, the relationships in the labor market uh, and other markets are are rebuilt after a negative shock. Uh, to focus on this paper is entirely about recoveries, has nothing to do, nothing more to say about what causes contractions and recessions. They're blank here, we left them out. Uh, 
and we treat them only as providing a state variable, namely the unemployment rate, at the beginning of a process. Uh, and that state variable is the only state variable in the in the Diamond Mortensen Pisaridis theory of unemployment. Um, and so, it, so we do a pretty standard dynamic analysis, which starts at a high unemployment rate, which is just zipped up because of some crisis. Uh, and then we'll pretty reliably uh, decline uh, basically 10% of the amount of unemployment per year. And that is along a, a line which is straight in logs. Uh, down to something like 3.5%. The lowest that unemployment has ever been is in the very first, uh, uh, down to 2.8%, which is shown on the far left. Ever since then, it seems like there is kind of a wall around 3.5%, which was exactly where the unemployment rate was in February of 2020, when the roof fell in. Um, notice that the, the continuing recovery, which is, uh, which is undergoing as I speak, is not included here. Uh, I will talk a little bit about it. We have a separate paper about it, uh, but it does involve some, an understanding of how different uh, the current recovery is, and how different the, the uh, extremely bad recession that uh, led to it uh, is. Um, okay, so uh, the, the second claim is that uh, Recessions uh, involve the displacement, the loss of jobs by large numbers of workers, uh, but that's not enough to explain all the unemployment that occurs and persists uh, during a recovery. So uh, we can say that unemployment is contagious. There's something about the same forces that gave rise to a mass of unemployment in a recession that results in High, much higher unemployment during the recovery at the beginning of the recovery and is only gradually worked off. So this question of, of persistent unemployment that arises from contagion and not just from the fact that it takes time for the displaced workers in the recession, that's gonna be another important part of the conclusions of, of this paper. Um, and here, well, you know, I'll come back to this, but this just shows what I'm talking about here. The, the colored, uh, uh, these measures uh, in, are a rough measure, back of the envelope type measure of what what job what job loss contributed to um, to unemployment, uh, but the total amount of excess unemployment uh, that is unemployment above three point five percent is this much larger number. Um, so so there's this again it illustrates the contagion. Of principle that we need to come to grips with. Um, our third claim uh, is that if you examine uh, the DMP model of unemployment, which is the governing theoretical model of macro today, um, you find that what, I, what you might call self-recovery, the dynamics of that system, the basic differential equation that governs the evolution of unemployment, uh, pushes unemployment downward uh, if it's above uh, the stationary point of the model. So if you, if you, and the model, as I mentioned before, has one state variable, the unemployment rate. So if you, if you start it, uh, then, then the DMP model uh, can be analyzed as a very standard uh, one-dimensional system in one state variable. Uh, and the, uh, and we'll show exactly how to do that and, and what it comes to. Um, but if you, if you just take a, the off the shelf version of the TMP model, it turns out the recovery occurs much too quickly. Uh, and that gets back to this question of contagion. And so the fourth point uh, that we make um, uh, is that uh, you need some negative feedback, something like feedback from unemployment uh, to uh, labor market tightness uh, in order to slow down the DMP model and get it to match. And I'll show you, we can calculate exactly what it takes to make the DMP model match the data. Um, but it remains the case that no external force is involved. Oddly, there's very little literature on this in macro. No one is really focused on the question of just what it takes to get unemployment down. 
it's, I think, recognized that recovery do generally occur, um, but there's not much of a not much of a of a macro literature. There's much more of a macro literature on what causes crises. Um, what do you mean by labor market tightness? Okay, so um, labor market tightness is a is a basic uh, unobserved index in the DMP model, uh, which is manifested uh, in in parallel according to an, a reasonable set of equations, um, which controls the job finding rate. So that would be the the monthly hazard of a job seeker uh, finding a job. It controls the job filling rate, uh, which is the monthly hazard that a, a, uh, a posted vacancy uh, is filled. Uh, and all those things are bound up together in a very clever set of, of uh, uh, equations uh, of the model. Um, I would, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, uh, I'm afraid that my, most of my discussion of the TMP models is going to rest on some uh, prior knowledge uh, of, of that model. But we'll come to that, we'll come to that. And you can ask as many questions as to clarify that. Okay, so that's basically the, the what this paper is about. Uh, if, Bob, Bob, on that one point, do you parameterize that relationship between unemployment and labor market tightness in a way that can account for very different speeds of recovery and give sure. us a clue as okay. to why they may have been different? Yeah, okay, well, we'll get to that. There's two equations um, and the parameters of those equations uh, read on exactly what you were asking about. So we'll get to that. So keep, reserve that question until sort of part three of this talk, but it's a very valid question. Okay, so, um, so I think you probably anticipated what, what I'm just gonna summarize our answer is that recoveries are endogenous. There, there's a natural force which is uh, contained within the DMP model, which causes job seekers to match with available jobs and to gradually lower unemployment. But in order to understand why it operates so slowly within a DMP framework, uh, in the, let me just illustrate how, how extreme this problem is. The average person uh, in average conditions uh, in the US labor market has about a 30% probability of taking a job in each month of search. If that were true of everybody who, were, uh, uh, who lost jobs uh, in, a, uh, in a crisis, millions of people, um, uh, unemployment would be back to normal uh, in just a few months, you know, maybe four or five months. But in fact, we only get 10% of the way. We, every year we only get 10% of the way uh, when, uh, when it looks like an individual gets uh, in one month gets 30% of the way. Um, so there is, and this, there's been a, a, a literature on this question that long predates that I was, I participated in, but uh, was, was kind of a separate topic. Um, so, so this, this puzzle uh, about why unemployment is so persistent when individuals solve their problem of unemployment so quickly is another major, major question that, that lies behind this paper and, and which provides an answer. A, an answer which can be dug out of the literature, but had not really been emphasized uh, before. Uh, but, but this idea that uh, on the one hand, there's a powerful force that restores full employment, but it restores full employment surprisingly slowly considering how fast people can find jobs. Uh, so, so this project has spawned three papers. Um, uh, this paper that I'm talking about here, I've mentioned already that uh, there's a, a, a paper that talks about what's special uh, in the current recovery. Um, and then there's, there's a, a essentially a econometric paper uh, that lies behind our documentation of the consistent but slow pace of US recoveries. And I'm gonna show 
the, the first part of this talk is going to include just a few uh, things from that, that third paper. It's mostly uh, the first paper. Okay, so first of all, you know, there's, everyone wants to know about the pandemic. This project began uh, in September of uh, 2019 when it seemed like uh, we would just go on forever having, a, having the, the longest labor market recovery uh, ever uh, in the recorded cycles, business cycle chronology of the US. Um, uh, so it seemed, so the way was clear then uh, obviously the uh, events, and this happens so often, it's happened to me so many times, I'm used to it, uh, then, then this tremendous you know, non-standard uh, crisis occurred, um, but, but we're on top of that. Uh, but it does, it does, it is quite properly a subject of a separate paper and it'll just come up uh, briefly. But, but um, the, the, almost all of the big spike of unemployment that struck in April of 2020 was people who did not lose their jobs. And it's amazing how the financial press always gets this wrong. Whenever, whenever they see uh, the payroll number rising, they say, oh, well, you know, the number of jobs has increased, but the payroll number does not measure the number of jobs. It measures the number of people working. And there was a huge number of people in April who had jobs and did return to their jobs, but were not working in April. Um, and that makes April of, of 2020 of just a completely unique month. Uh, very rapidly, that that uh, the, those people have been recalled, and mostly uh, get recalled and and are not searching for work and are are should not be considered to be. They're they're. It's fully correct to call them unemployed, uh, but uh, it's a very different type of unemployment. Um, so we've been working on the question of what's a good name for that. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's, it's people who are, have jobs but are not at work. And, they, and normally that's less than 1% of the, of, the uh, uh, of employment uh, or um, percentage of the labor force. Um, but it, then it zoomed up in April and then it's been, been declining very rapidly. So we've had, if you, you'd say, well, we were completely wrong about, about uh, slow recoveries. If you, if you just look at the people that are jobless unemployed, their behavior during this time looks very much like a, a very mild recession. So that, that was 3% of the labor force in, in February of 2020. Uh, it rose to about 5% of the labor force. So there was a recession, but a pretty mild recession as measured by that measure. Uh, and then it's, it's been continuing at about 5%. It's now dominant uh, in unemployment. We're pretty much back to the situation where the unemployed are mostly jobless, almost entirely jobless. Um, uh, and now, now our thinking would say from this point on, uh, if, things, if things remain normal as they do in a recovery, we should see a typical recovery uh, because the, the job holding unemployed are now almost back to normal, which is less than 1% of, of the labor force. Okay, so, so in other words, it's not nearly as big an embarrassment to, to our thinking once you, once you understand just this simple fact that we were counting as unemployed, properly counting as unemployed, um, people who were not working, and that's why they're unemployed. They'd like to be working, but they weren't. Uh, and uh, but they had jobs, and the fact that they had jobs to go back to was absolutely central to their condition. Okay, so there's a there's there's a, re a relevant literature which will cite as we go along, but there's two papers that that are really central that I deserve highlighting uh, at the beginning. There's a paper by Cole and Rogerson, and published in 1999, although it was written long before. It was it was influential on me in a paper I wrote in 1995, so it took a while to, to get into print, but. Um, but it was in the 90s. Um, and that, that showed that recoveries are much slower than you'd expect from evidence on job finding rates. There's, there's an embarrassment uh, in uh, DMP theory uh, that, that calls for some modification, uh, and I'll go into that later. Um, then there's a paper by Fujita and Gary Ramey, which I, 
put it with examine the DMP model directly and showed that it was an assumption of an extremely high elasticity vacancy creation that causes that problem. So he was the first uh, in this literature on, on, on uh, that paper that uh, Kujian and Ramey was, was the first paper that uh, took aim at this question of, of why it took unemployment itself so long uh, by imposing adjustment costs and, and job filling. Um, oops. Okay, so, so, so now I'm gonna talk about the, what we call the inexorable recovery. Um, uh, and here's this picture again, and so I won't say too much more about that. Um, but uh, it's, we, we found that most audiences are prepared to just look at this picture and say, wow, we never did it that way. We never made that picture. We didn't, we didn't, it didn't occur to us to remove the, the, the uh, big increases in unemployment and just look at the, how even the, uh, the decline is. And, and so we accept your, we accept your, your characterization, but then our, our discussants at the, at, at the conference, um, took aim mostly at saying, well, it's not quite true. You know, look, there's some little blips, but anyway, we think that that carries the day. If you look at it in terms of, of take, looking at log unemployment uh, by, by recovery, then you can see that with the recoveries beginning in 1961, all occurred at very close to uh, our, our sort of basic number of uh, 0.1. That means 10% of unemployment is erased each year. These are annual rates. Um, well, uh, yeah. but GDP does not recover at the same rate. So not at all. It's interesting that you you have you have a model that the labor market turns along the way it does, and sometimes GDP is booming and sometimes it's not. Right. Okay. So so there's a four author paper. Maybe I should have mentioned that here because it was one of the my first entries into this with. Um, John Fernald and uh, Jim Stock, uh, uh, that uh, dissects the uh, uh, recovery from the Great Recession. Uh, it was published, I think, in 2017. Um, and uh, it, it, shows, it shows exactly why the US economy generated a very unusual and unusually slow recovery of output at the same time that uh, the recovery of unemployment was completely normal, completely normal. Look at this. So that that was the 2009, that's, that's this, this um, um, recovery here, which is just right on the spot. There was nothing slow about that recovery measured by unemployment, but there were two drags on the economy uh, in terms of output, one was labor force participation uh, contracted in some cases, and, but in many cases uh, was a contributor during this period. Uh, and the other was productivity was, was rising at unusually low rates, close to zero. Um, so, I don't, you know, there, what, I think one, one of the things that the, the movements of, of, of output, GDP uh, in the US economy are half cycle and half other stuff. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to measure the cycle by confusingly look at the other stuff, um, then, then, then you have a problem. If you look at unemployment, you get a very clear picture of unemployment. And unemployment does seem to be the single best measure of unused resources. Uh, if you think uh, Tyler, a cycle. Tyler, Tyler Goodspeed has a question. Tyler, you wanna jump in? Oh, no, I was just uh, the point of information about uh, sort of the, the nature of job losses uh, back in, in March and April. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Well, you, we, I, there's been, well, so first of all, remember that there wasn't that much job loss in, in, uh, in March and April. People were removed from work, but they, their jobs were not taken away from them. Um, but that was done in very large amounts in kind of a panicked response, it appears, because uh, a lot of the recalls occurred in the following month in May. Um, so your concept of job is more expansive than the usual 
formal temporary layoff, right? It's, it's, you know that there's some guy there, a job there, and you can get it when you want. No, it's not. It's the the initiative of a recall that comes from the employer, not from the employee. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the obviously someone who's lost a job has has uh, can either say I'm just going to wait because I think I'm going to be recalled in a month or two, um, which is in in most cases uh, that's workers do that because because layoffs are are just just last a month or two. I just meant on a data basis. This is based on asking people, do you expect that you can get back to your regular job? Well, it's a little more subtle. I don't know. I, you know, we, we shouldn't get into we can talk about that later. It's, oh, Elena, it's, Pastor Ina has a question, Bob. Elena? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. So very much along the line of John's, uh, just a clarification. So the, what we saw in the graph and you mentioned that an MBR Mark Ronald discussed and asked about it. Um, do you do you treat in any way the unemployment rate measure from the data? Do you smooth it in any way? Do you HP filter it? Uh, would that give you a different picture at all? This may be a technical debate in the literature. And you've talked a lot in some of your recent work about the importance of heterogeneity behind this aggregate of finding and separation rates. Sure. How does that so, matter? Thank you. So first of all, I am not now, nor have I ever been a user of an HP filter. I know, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. <laughs> so you can take that off. <laughs> um, uh, no, this is this is absolutely literally uh, the unemployment number. Um, uh, we've we've tried uh, doing the same analysis using you know exactly the same software uh, for a lot of uh, sub measures and also. You know the the more inclusive and less inclusive uh, unemployment measures. They all they all have basically the same character. Um, but uh, there no the, the work that you mentioned on on heterogeneity does come up uh, in a way which we'll we'll come to. So uh, keep that idea in mind. But um, but but in terms of what we actually use for this analysis, uh, it turns out that the headline uh, unemployment rate. Really tells the story, and other other unemployment rates tell the same story. So there's just no issue there. Um, Thank you. Uh, I I won't say anything more about it, but uh, Jim Hamilton has uh, a very successful line of work, and and we're very sympathetic to it because uh, it makes a clean distinction which had been missing so from so much of the literature between expansions and contractions. So. So his idea was you have a, a Markov switching model. There's 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 a hidden state uh, which uh, is observed with noise, and we've applied that uh, using exactly his uh, likelihood function, uh, and and it gives completely supportive results. We've we've worked mainly uh, because of our emphasis on on uh, the homogeneity. We'd like to look at, at we'd like to identify uh, uh, recoveries. So we do it in a more traditional way with using a, a, a chronology. We've experimented with different chronologies and they all give very similar uh, results. So we do, we, we've taken some grief, especially again by ultra persnickety uh, discussants. Um, uh, on well, is it really true? You know, did you check for this and that? And uh, so we checked, for example, for any curvature in the relationship. Is it really just log linear, or is it something else? Or how did you pick log linear? Uh, we picked it because because it it, it was quite conspicuously right. <laughs> got got straight lines, and then then we tested that econometrically, and and the test is uh, supportive. The confidence zero lies comfortably within the zero, which is our number, lies comfortably within the uh, uh, rather tight confidence uh, interval. Uh, the we also tested the the hypothesis that the seven seven recoveries come from the same uh, dis distribution with no difference in means, and again similar results that are supportive. 
Okay, so so just to summarize the, where we stand and how this differs from uh, many early papers, some of which are cited here, in particular this paper by Nakamura and Steinson, which is coming out in the JPE, uh, has gotten a lot of attention and, and summarizes this earlier work. Uh, a lot of it going back to Milton Friedman's uh, work on what he called the plucking model. Um, uh, a lot of that work is held back, I would say, by uh, by trying to use by not following Hamilton's track, uh, but but just using standard VAR type analysis, and that's really not suited to dealing with this problem. Uh, but others like Kim and Nelson and, and Dr. Morenstein and others do it right. Um, but but none of that literature focused on what we did, which is to emphasize how slow and uniform the uh, the recovery declines in unemployment are. So that's a new topic that, that we've established here. Um, OK, so now the second point I want to uh, deal with is this idea that maybe maybe this persistence is of total unemployment reflects the persistence of unemployment at the personal level. So what, how big is the contribution? stating it more neutrally, how big is the contribution of the very people who lost jobs and we know in some cases uh, have relatively low job finding rates. Um, but, but if we trace those people through the data, which we can to the extent we can, uh, and then find out what, how many of them remained unemployed a year or two later, uh, then we can find out how important that factor is relative to uh, our concern with the fact that uh, it appears that unemployment is contagious. That is, the, the unemployment that, that lingers after a recession uh, uh, contributes through an externality to uh, cause the labor market to be less tight and with higher unemployment. Um, OK, so, so we um, do you let, yeah. There's just a standard, uh, and there's a couple of standard ones. I don't know how, to what extent you want to get into these, but one is that all distributions have fat tails. So the average person finds a job in uh, in three months uh, or 30% a month, but there's a couple, there's a small core who take forever. And that's that's the reason why the average stays high. Sure, sure. You have okay. something more that, to say that, that. But if, if, if that were true, then it would show up in the calculations we're doing, so. Okay, um, you'll have that heterogeneity. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're we we just look at everybody. So, in, uh, if that would that would just say something which is known to be true that that uh, the uh, those people who have gone say a year without finding a job have much lower job finding hazard. Right. But we include those people. So at a, at a verbal level, your explanation that when unemployment is high, labor markets are tight doesn't make it sound like it's gonna be easy for an, even an individual to find a job, um, but you'll, you'll explain. Well, tight, so tight means it's easy to find a job. Just got the vocabulary. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, go, go for it. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, so, so this, is a, this is a two part analysis. One is looking at uh, people who lost jobs. Well, people lose jobs all the time and so this is this is uh, one reasonable proxy for uh, for job loss, which is layoffs. That's as people who where the initiative is for ending a job has come from an employer, um, uh, and in the uh, Jolts turnover data, um, uh, layoffs are measured, and you see uh, now that Jolt started in two thousand, so we only. Uh, as far as we're concerned, there was only one recession uh, to look at. Um, uh, and, uh, and you see this big spike of layoffs. So it's, it's, clear that, it's clear that the basic idea that a recession is a time when there's a lot of job loss, which has been disputed by some people, uh, is correct. But it also rises out of a pretty high base level, um, uh, which you can see here. Uh, and in particular, there was a, a recession in uh, 2001, which, which generates a, only as kind of a small spike right here, but it wasn't, it was a baby recession compared to the Great Recession. Uh, 
Okay, so we have a, a variety of uh, measures, uh, which I won't go into in any great time, but you're invited to see in the paper. Um, and they're, they're listed here. So jolts, there's, there's uh, the so-called job destruction. Uh, uh, there is the, there's a displacement survey that uh, is an add-on to the current population survey. And then there's the mass layoff. And those, those all give uh, different numbers. The jolts layoffs number, layoffs number is much bigger than, uh, for example, displacement. Displacement is loss of a job by somebody who had tenure of at least three years uh, uh, and who's uh, not, a, not a young person. Um, and you can see that number, the red number is much smaller. But these are various measures. Uh, and they all agree that there was a lot more job loss in 2008, 2009 uh, than is normal. Um, and then, and then this whole calculation, and I mentioned this before, is, is the amount of excess unemployment. So you can see right away that there's some going to be some shortfall, even if oh, the only one that has any hope of, of, of capturing what's going on is the Jones number. Um, all these other numbers, um, even if these people remained unemployed throughout the period, they still wouldn't account for the total uh, area under the, under the excess unemployment number. Um, so um, then if you do an exercise that we uh, describe at some length in the paper, which I won't describe now, um, uh, and which is how much that, that personal unemployment lingers, uh, then you get these, these areas. Um, and again, the, the Jolt's layoffs number um, is the only one that uh, has any substantial fraction of the total, but even it is, is no more than something like a quarter of the total. Um, so the conclusion uh, is very, tr is unambiguous that what we call a direct channel, which is simply the fact that some of the reason that un aggregate unemployment is, is, uh, is uh, lasts as long as it does, uh, is that it's happening to the very individuals who got, got the process started. But we want to look elsewhere then uh, in, in, the, in DMP theory uh, to uh, figure out um, uh, how, we, how we can make unemployment uh, uh, contagious. So that's the, um, okay, so I think I've probably covered this already. There, I mentioned this Colin Rogerson paper. Um, the, we consider what we call the uh, effective exit rate from unemployment. Um, and this, the, these are factors that, are, that lie behind the calculations I just showed you. Um, uh, that uh, if you look at the careers of people who lose jobs, you find that uh, they, they go through a process uh, of reemployment search, which does not result in, in a, them, most of them, relatively few of them, actually, even if they take a job, it's not, it's often an interim job. Um, and the uh, probability of uh, leaving or losing uh, those jobs is very high. That's well known in the turnover uh, literature. Um, so, uh, so we, in terms of of coming up with some notion of this process that makes sense for these calculations, we have this idea of an effective exit rate, which is if you if you say, okay, well, the people are going through kind of a grinder uh, in which they are ultimately uh, going to find a job which which is a good match and is lasting, um, but uh, if you if you look at those at the data and the calculations are in the paper, I won't describe them now. Um, uh, you you get an effective exit rate of about 0.1 uh, as against the exit rate from unemployment spells uh, for for the standard group, which is about 0.5. For the reason that John mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, the, although the control group gets 0.5, uh, 
people in the tails get push it down to um, a number more like 0.3, which is the number I mentioned before. So Bob is the picture that that they, they become sort of like young young people, you know, cycle through a couple of jobs and then they sort of get married. Sure, so you're that's saying right. that these people are kind of like young people again. They get a job, lose a job, get a job, lose a lose a job, and that's or or quit a job actually rather than in, in their search for some quit. new more permanent. Yeah. Quits are a big part of the story. Yeah, quit rates are elevated for inexperienced workers. They're elevated for workers who definitively lost a job. Uh, and take an easy job to get job like a like tending bar, uh, and then they quit that job because they found something that's better. Um, we look at different categories of unemployment uh, uh, for this process that we call circling, uh, which is uh, basically a high turnover, um, and you can see you can see the same uh, persistence uh, in in those measures, as we talked about uh, in, uh, in unemployment. So this is, this is employment, but uh, you get a, a big spike uh, in, uh, uh, in, peop in, in, in the permanent job losers, which, which, are, which are the people uh, with the lowest job finding hazard. Okay, so I, I think we've, this is just a summary of all these uh, things that uh, I said that um, the temporary jobs uh, circling between unemployment and out of labor force and the like uh, uh, give rise to uh, a, a extension of unemployment among individuals, but it's not, it's not enough. There are cal earlier calculations based on these numbers show that it's not enough uh, to mean that just the, the immediate victims, the, those who lost jobs in the recession, it takes more than that. It, you need some kind of a model of induced downstream unemployment to make sense uh, out of the extreme persistence of unemployment relative to anything that, that is, is uh, measured at the individual level. Um, so this is all uh, providing a lot of new empirical work uh, that lies behind uh, the, uh, and, and makes it clear that this is not the way to answer the Colin Rogerson, uh, Colin Rogerson's challenge is bigger than just saying that, uh, that there's uh, persistence at the personal level. There's persistence that arises from some other source and we'd like to, and the purpose point, point of the papers to try to track down uh, that course. So, okay, so that brings the DMP model. Okay, so- It's also very clear. We're just, we wanna to get to the theory now. Go ahead. Okay, here we are. We got to the model in just over half an hour. That's pretty good. Um, uh, okay, so, so we're gonna start with the off the shelf uh, DMP model. And after I, I came up with uh, this, um, I went back and, and read P. Cerini's uh, textbook on the DMP model. And in chapter one, it has an illustration, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which is absolutely identical to the one that I had created you know, 25 years later. Um, so it's an aspect of the DMP model that has not been studied very much. Uh, it's interesting. OK, so, uh, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the standard derivation of the uh, DMP model. Um, uh, I'm going to do kind of a shortcut that uh, some people would find uh, probably leaving out the some of the interesting parts. But um, but it's what what I want to do. I think is adequate for um, for these purposes. And maybe Bob, but given that we have time, if I may ask one more questions about oh, the evidence so far. So you pointed out very convincingly that there's a certain uniformity in the data, in the, in the speed of the recoveries. But there, of course, there was a lot of debate within the literature after the past recession that the nature of it be a real, more financial, may have bearing on the, the type and length of recovery to be expected. Of course, you have work on this as well that, that we know. Um, what are your thoughts? 
somehow, I, of course, the argument econometrically, even that the unemployment rate is a sufficient statistic, a sufficient stock variable for that, but at a finer granular level, is there any correspondence of interest that you detect between the speed of the drop and the speed of the car or the shape of it or you know the half-life of the two? Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I think uh, the, the, this question that I went over briefly of what you're trying to measure uh, and, and creating a cyclical measure, uh, and and then what 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 works empirically. Uh, most most thinking about the business cycle has has been carried out in terms of of real GDP, I believe. When people talk about uh, uh, a slow recovery, they typically draw a picture of real GDP, um, and and then. So then the four author paper that I mentioned is just a completely, uh, a very complete uh, expl explanation of all the non-cyclical sources that are present. Taking as uh, many of us believe that the unemployment rate is actually the best measure of the cycle. If you think that the business cycle uh, have, uh, features fluctuations uh, in the amount of uh, unused uh, resources in the economy. And, I, and it seems like that's a good starting point. Um, that's true, I didn't mind employment, that's right. Yeah, okay, so, so, okay, so employment, employment is very susceptible to big changes in participation. Um, and, and participation is just something uh, that, uh, I mean, it reads on, on the, utilization of, of labor, but, uh, or at least on the utilization of people's time. But uh, if, you, if you think that most of the, most of the fluctuations in, in productivity, it, sorry, in, in participation uh, are, arise from uh, you know, household labor, you know, fundamental household labor decisions about how much to offer in the market. Um, there's, there's very little of business cycle and participation. I think it's important to understand that so that uh, uh, you, it's, it, these are really separate things. And if you use a measure that is contaminated because it, it, it throws participation into part of the business cycle, you get very, you know, that, give, that, that gave rise to this concept of jobless recoveries. Jobless recoveries were just recoveries that occurred in a time when participation was declining. So, so you find, even though unemployment was disappearing, um, it wasn't the the growth of jobs was not consistent with the movement of, of un, un, unemployment because participation was declining. That was a, a big discussion in the last recession. Was the impediments to participate? This participation rate really did collapse in two thousand and eight, and people were slowly drawn in. To, no. You're going to just say that's not relevant for labor no, no, markets. That, that is a complete myth. That's what I wanted you to I say. Since you're not, since you're not a specialist in this area, I don't have to blame you for falling for the myth because of the thousands of people have said it. There's a very interesting pair of Brookings papers um, that uh, one published uh, in 2007, so pre, completely uninfluenced uh, by the Great Recession, and uh, and then, then a, a, a careful examination of that after the Great Recession, showing that what happened to participation was exactly what was forecasted in the 2007 paper, and therefore the, the residual effect of the Great Recession on participation was literally zero, zero in every quarter. Um, it's it's really pretty amazing, um, and yet people. Yeah, are, I wish I could bring in Casey Mulligan to fight with you on it, but I can't. <laughs> yes, well, irrelevant to your point. I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of his work. <laughs> I have to say. No, Bob, you have to give us the, the theory of this. Let's go. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I get sidetracked. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So let's let's talk about tightness. So first of all, in in DMP analysis, tightness is always called theta, um, and 
uh, it's defined as the ratio of, of vacancies to unemployment. So it's going to be a number that in a tight market is, is high uh, when it's uh, easy for workers to find jobs. Uh, so there's relatively little in the denominator and hard for work, employers to find workers. So there's a big number in the numerator. So the ratio of the two is a very sensitive measure uh, of labor market tightness. Um, then if you, if you trace through the theory, and I, I, this is where I'll, I'll ask you to take my word for it, um, there, are, there are four determinants uh, shown in this, in this big parenthesis up here. Um, there's uh, the efficiency of uh, the search process. Uh, so this advantageous ratio is bigger if search is more efficient in terms of standardizing on unemployment and, and uh, uh, vacancies. Uh, uh, you can think of them as productive inputs, say with the Cobb Douglas production function, the mu is the efficiency factor, usually called A in, in a Cobb Douglas, uh, usually called mu in, in here, but it's the same thing, it's a production function, producing matches out of unemployment and vacancies. Um, the, uh, then there's three determinants of the economic payoff to uh, uh, creating a vacancy. Uh, one is that P, which is the present value of a newly hired worker's uh, productivity at the firm, minus uh, what the worker has to be paid so that this is the payoff in terms of this margin. Um, that's compared to the, uh, the cost of maintaining a vacancy per month. So all these things make sense. Um, and then uh, the two appears here because of, of the fact that theta has this sort of double, double whammy. It, has, it looks both at the unemployment and vacancies. So, so uh, so it could be sensitive both because uh, a favorable movement, say in P relative to W, is, gonna, uh, uh, is, is going to increase vacancies and decrease unemployment. And that's where you get the two from. So, uh, okay, so um, now what I'm leaving out and what occupies uh, 15,000 pages of literature on this is how W is determined. But my position on that has always been the same as there's a million different ways W could be determined and they all have interesting factors. But um, uh, as long as P is not changing very much, then W is probably gonna stay is similar. The pr perspective I'm gonna take is that all these things combined are constants. They're not sources of change. Um, that the, and that the only source of change is down here. This is the law of motion of this single state variable u. Uh, and it says that the change in u uh, uh, is employment, which is one minus the number of unemployed people times the separation rate. So this is, this is flows out of, um, flows into unemployment. Uh, and then flows out of employment, unemployment are, uh, 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 jobs found, and that's number of people searching times the efficiency parameter of search times uh, the square root of. Uh, so the, the 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 doubling that I mentioned here is taken back from you when you get look at one thing like here the the job finding rate or equally the job filling rate. Um, okay, so so in traditionally in this literature, even in, even the papers that I've written. Uh, people just forget about this. Uh, they mainly are interested in the steady state of unemployment, so they just call u dot zero, and then uh, that tells them something. Uh, and the, all the activity in the literature has been here. I want to reverse that. I want to say I'm going to take all these things to be constants, so that uh, the job finding rate and the job filling rate and tightness will just remain the same all the time. Um, now, obviously, that's not going to be true in a crisis, but it's arguably true during a you know, uh, recovery is a period of economic quiescence 
So let's extend that principle to all these things. So whatever they are, we can take this to be a constant. Then normally people say, well, then unemployment's gonna be a constant and that's the end of the story, but that's not right. If you start with the state variable at an elevated level, say 10% um, was in the, in the, was the highest unemployment rate in the Great Recession, uh, then you're gonna get dynamics from this law of motion, which are going to capture you know, the favorable effects of job finding and the unfavorable effects of job losing uh, in terms of, uh, and you're gonna get a path of unemployment out of, uh, out of this equation. That's, that's all the action and the data is gonna come from this equation, usually neglected, uh, and none of it from here, even though the, the all literature, uh, especially the literature that, that, that uh, Rob Scheimer kicked off in his paper uh, now almost 20 years ago, um, uh, that, that was very concerned with the, the, the question of uh, what happens when P minus W changes, what happens when P changes, P is exogenous to the, to the employment decision let's say. Uh, so we're forgetting that. We're just concentrating on this law of motion. Okay, so, so we're gonna do that. Now, there's a differential equation. So you, you uh, analyze it in terms of, uh, of a, uh, this diagram, which uh, has uh, the unemployment rate uh, on the horizontal axis and tightness uh, on the vertical axis. But, the, but in, this, in this model, this, this way of running the model, tightness never changes. So, so the blue line, which is gonna be the line that the labor market is confined to, is, is always gonna move back and forth. You know, whatever happens to these, uh, to these variables uh, uh, is, gonna, is gonna induce movements back and forth. Now, if nothing's happening to those variables, so, so uh, the blue line is, is just flat. You start here. So here we are in 2009, 10% unemployment. Um, then you're gonna follow that differential equation and you're gonna go boom over here. But how fast do you go? Now now's where the parameter values matter. And if you use standard parameter values, uh, each of these bumps is a month. So the first month you close a considerable amount of the gap and then you close a little more and then and you get this exponential movement, which very quickly takes you effectively to full employment. Okay, so, so this is the problem with Cole and Rogerson. This is, this is a diagram which they didn't, their paper is really hard to read. It doesn't have anything this simple in it, but this is what the point they're making um, uh, in a very complicated way. Uh, but here done it in exactly, and this is the diagram that, that is exactly the same if you read Pisarides chapter one. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, uh, wh why is, uh, wh what, how can we change this? Um, and that's what the rest of the paper is about. So first of all, we can, we can divide, we can talk about a recovery path, uh, which is, uh, here's the path that we were just talking about where you go, unemployment falls very quickly at the beginning, and then you're essentially back to full employment just in a few months. And here's what actually happened after 2009. Here's the close to linear, uh, or in this case, uh, log linear uh, path um, in, in that particular recovery. You can see it's not quite a straight line um, or a curved line. It's not quite, uh, but it's pretty close. Um, well, there's a, this is, seems like a hopeless gap between um, uh, uh, a uh, what the model's saying and what what actually happens. It, it seems like it's kind of fatal, uh, and I think it is. And it shows that there's something just fundamental left out of uh, of the DMP model. And as I mentioned, the 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 first people who who emphatically made that point were was the Ramey paper. Um, uh, which deserves a lot of credit in this literature. I think it's not as well known as it should be. 
that it doesn't that the idea in that paper doesn't quite fit directly in although it's you could sort of shoehorn it in but i won't i won't go into that i'll just talk now about what we want to do is somehow change change what's wrong with this uh setup what's wrong with this setup is that it generates this very large gap uh between it generates a lot of theta or it preserves theta, I should say that. Um, uh, and it, it, it says that there's a huge incentive for, for employers to uh, create jobs and that makes the process occur very quickly. Uh, now, uh, the Ramey paper uh, says, uh, no, there's adjustment costs uh, and the adjustment costs uh, limit the effect of that, and the the effect if if you if you had the same version of this diagram would be uh, you wouldn't move nearly as much. Uh, the incentive you would you would create a lot of vacancies, but then the marginal cost of a vacancy would rise to a very high level, and that would that would slow down this process. Um, okay, so uh, but. We chose a somewhat different approach, and I, uh, which it seems like there's a lot of literature, which uh, even though the authors didn't, weren't particularly aimed at this persistence issue, does read on persistence. And I'll we'll go over that in a second. Um, uh, uh, so instead of having theta be a constant, and we're gonna continue to take this part of the equation, we're gonna add another effect, which is something that re with higher unemployment uh, uh, reduces theta. So it overcomes this problem uh, that uh, when, you're, when you have high unemployment, uh, there's just a gigantic payoff to, to creating vacancies and nothing to stop it. Uh, now, now with high unemployment, so when you start with high unemployment, then, then theta is actually much lower than it would be. So there's gonna be some kind of externality associated with, uh, with unemployment that has that effect. So we're looking for some, some positively sloped function of, of uh, U to call gamma uh, and ask where that might come from. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that we can read the gamma function. You might think, well, how would you ever figure out what gamma is? Well, you can read the gamma function directly out of the data provided that you believe that, uh, uh, that the other piece of this is, is, uh, uh, is a constant. So we're gonna, that'll be a maintained hypothesis here then. Uh, okay, so if you do that. Uh, Bob, then, are you gonna uh, tell us a story for gamma, I hope? Oh yeah, yeah, coming okay. up, coming up. Story slide coming up. Uh, it'll, it'll take you, three years to read all the papers in the story slide. So um, a lot of people have worked out, have talked about this subject without realizing how important it was for this aspect of it. Um, and we'll come to that, but bear with me. Um, all right, so, uh, well, how do we figure out what this function is? Well, the, this function maps, this is a constant. So it maps u, uh, into theta, well, those are two observable variables. So this, this function gamma is defined implicitly uh, by just looking at, just pairing an, an unemployment with the theta. So we can do that in the diagram and it all makes sense. So, so this is just this pairing of, uh, so each dot here uh, says, okay, uh, we know what tightness is, we know what unemployment was. So in, in this model, it must be that that's where you are uh, in, in this phase diagram. Um, and you can see it all works just the way it should. Uh, the, the blue line is always to the right of the orange line. So there's always, now that's telling you that, see on this side, on this, on this side, it says unemployment declining. So as long as, as long as you're in safe territory, which is the blue line being on the, on the right side of, of the uh, orange line, then 
then the economy is doing what we claim that it does. That is, uh, unemployment declines, uh, but it declines, declines very slowly because remember the orange line is where unemployment's not changing at all. So when the blue line is close to the orange line, uh, it means that we're moving very slowly. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, if, the, if, if the blue line crossed over into the orange territory for very long, then you'd have an unstable system and you'd have a, uh, you know, it wouldn't be plausible. Uh, hey Bob, Bob, we just have about 10 minutes left if you huh? could. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so I've got, I've, okay, so here you are. Um, all right, so, so I've talked about Fujita and Ramey um, uh, and, and there's a more recent paper, uh, a couple more recent, quite recent papers, but the Fujita Ramey paper is quite clear and, uh, uh, and it just says that uh, this, there's, there's a response that's similar. So this, or I guess the simplest way to put this is that the uh, supply of uh, vacancies is perfectly elastic in the standard DMP model, but that's probably unrealistic. If there's, if it's, if, if piling on resources to hire more people and get the unemployment rate down quickly is expensive, then they're going to ride up the marginal cost of of uh, vacancy creation, and that's going to slow things down. Um, so you could actually build that uh, into this model through, instead of making this gamma over here, you could make this kappa of u, and then you could make that an increasing function. That would have the same effect since it's in the denominator. So although it does, it's not literally in this form, uh, it would be easy to rewrite it so that it was. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, I think it's, and I think, as I mentioned, I think that paper is somewhat neglected in this unemployment persistence literature. Um, uh, okay, so then there's the possibility of, uh, of congestion effects or externalities uh, in the recruiting process. So, uh, so you can see I've been involved in this for a while, a couple of unpublished papers, um, unsuccessful papers, not. I, I wasn't. I, I didn't think they would push these subject far enough to try to publish them. Or at least one of them was rejected once, but otherwise. Uh, hey, Bob. Uh, Krishna has a question. You wanna take yeah. it now? Krishna, go up. Krishna. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, um, Bob. Forgive me for for cutting in. Just, was just grappling with this question of the relationship between tightness and the unemployment rate. So one of the things that we observe right now in the current cycle is that the openings to unemployment rate is very elevated, lots of openings, despite the fact that the unemployment rate itself is still relatively high. Does that suggest that something odd is going on in this cycle relative to your, uh, your general adverse feedback loop, or have I misunderstood something about that part of the presentation? Uh, no, I think that uh, I, I, so Marianne and I have written a whole paper on that, which I, uh, which was in that list of, um, uh, you, if, you, if you recognize what the right way to measure tightness is uh, by excluding, uh, by, by having an unemployment measure, which uh, doesn't, does not include the non-searchers. Remember, unemployment is there because of the effect of search. If people are not searching because they're, they're on recall, um, then, then you get a reasonably coherent uh, rationalization of what's. Uh, uh, there are there's a number of people who uh, who do this. Uh, uh, well, let me. I don't have enough time. Let me read that paper. Uh, it's a good, very good question. Deserves a good answer, and there is, I think, the right answer in that paper. Well, these, these stories don't. Um, you're selling them as all equivalent, but even I can tell they're not. So, for example. A uh, adjustment cost story says that uh, it's less profitable to hire a margin to post a marginal vacancy when you are hiring a lot of people, not when the unemployment rate is high. Um, so I get the picture. When, what you need is when the unemployment rate is high, it's not profitable to post a lot of vacancies. 
Uh, so that doesn't sound like adjustment costs. That does sound like there's a pool of not very good people out here, or for some other reason, it's not a good time to expand your business. No, no, this is, this is just like, suppose that there was a big payoff to some other form of investment, but, but you have to write up the adjustment. To, to get a high flow, you have to write up the, uh, the, the adjustment schedule. Adjustment cost depends on how many people you're hiring, not on how oh, many okay. people are employed out there. But the but the, the the time derivative of unemployment is is exactly measures that. And it, it I, I'm it's very persuasive because if you just think, it's obvious that in you know 2010 was not a time when you wanted to expand your workforce by 30 percent, because the costs of a of a uh, of a vacancy isn't just the cost of posting a job; it's a cost of a hundred other things of hiring somebody. I, I thought it. I was making your point. You're, but I, you're, I you're accusing Fujita and Ramey, both of whom are smart guys, of making a fundamental error. And I think if you read the paper, you'd see that. That's no, no, they, they, not right. Well, so, Bob, why don't you sort of wrap up a little bit? Yeah, of course, sorry. I think, as usual, I dawdled in some areas. And, okay. Um, let me see if I can get the, okay, so matching efficiency, a topic that I've worked on uh, is, is kind of an obvious one that if, a, if, a, if matching efficiency declines, uh, if so in that, in that compound thing that includes mu, so if, if, you, if you get a, a, a big negative effect of mu from, from the conditions that are, exist when, the, when unemployment is high, that would, that would work. And, and the, my paper with uh, Schulhofer Vol definitely shows that big time. So we, had, we didn't realize that we didn't push the paper for that reason. Okay, so to, in my mind, this one, uh, the externalities or, or other adverse effects and, uh, and, the, and the, the, just the technical, uh, I, think, I think the three of these are probably enough to, to create an answer. Um, you know, obviously, much more work would remain uh, remains to really try to solve that problem. Um, you have any sense of which of these is likely to have the most explanation to bring the curves together? Well, I, I already indicated three of them. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think I could go beyond that. Uh, but there, uh, three of them are kind of solid. So, uh, I, and I have no reason to think that they don't. They don't all belong. <laughs> I think you have to add them up. Uh, right. Uh, in other words, they're they're uh, they really it was kind of a, a there's there's a fundamentally unrealistic aspect of that phase diagram that uh, that this this is is exposed. I don't think it's been described that way anywhere in the literature before. But um, can I take it as, as a time of high unemployment? it's really hard to screen your workers. And so that's what you mean by matching efficiency. A whole bunch of people applying who aren't qualified. It's, and it's just very hard to get the right person in the door. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually just, a, yeah, it's a composition. It's, it's just that on a, on a periods of unemployment uh, immediately following a, a crisis uh, brings, has results in a very different type of worker and, and, and higher recruiting costs. I think that's what you're saying. Uh, I don't know if you have time, Bob, I had a curiosity along the line of what John Taylor asked you. So the, I can imagine that you can get different reduced form interactions or dependencies between theta and you, depending on the primitive story. And as you mentioned, you can have kappa, the job posting cost, depending on you rather than an additively separable gamma U function. Right. And I'm thinking that that would imply different derivatives, i.e. different interaction, for instance, with P and W, meaning different marginal effect at different level of mm -hmm. wage jobs. Right. Is the, do you have a sense that in, we, we can discriminate in a way among primitive mechanisms? Not yet. You know, I've just, I've just finished reading all these papers. <laughs> There's a... Uh... Bob, you never closed the loop on, on um, the difference between the individual job finding rate and the aggregate decline in unemployment, because the stories you're telling oh. don't, don't have that, do they? Oh, sure. The, 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 each individual, every, every job seeker, irrespective of whether they were a layoff victim or not, 
uh, is affected by uh, market tightness. So I'm saying that I'm saying that the presence of a certain number of unemployed results in market tightness declining, and that reduces that raises unemployment for everybody. So I think we're just about out of time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, oh, I was just going to show you one picture. Okay. Uh, the, the one variable that that uh, has just remarkable correlation is a financial variable, and that's uh, tees out the level of of the senior loan officer survey, uh, which I which I had done earlier, uh, and just compare it. So it turns out the best I could say about this so far is that it's kind of a similar problem of matching uh, in, matching in financial markets as financing in in, in, in uh, uh, the labor market, anyway. I like this ending. You like so, uh, there's a few people who uh, had questions oh. in the chat room. We'll send that to you. That's okay. 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 And uh, thank you so much. This is terrific. Um, we appreciate it. We learned a lot. A lot of questions that need answering, uh, thanks to your paper.